We also learn from the same section in Isaiah that when Yahweh created the universe, he did it alone. As written in Isaiah 44, 24, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Yet the New Testament tells us explicitly that the Son was involved in creation. In John 1, 1, Jesus, uh, John uses the language of Genesis 1, 1 in the Septuagint, saying that the word was in the beginning, N-R-K, just like in the beginning God created, Genesis 1, 1. So was Yahweh God alone at the time of creation, or was the Son involved in the creation? I don't know about you, but this sounds very confusing. It's typical for Trinitarians to confuse the Creator with the one he creates through. So who exactly created what, or should we say what created who? So we have the affirmation prophet Isaiah. The Lord, the true God, said these things. He created the sky and spread it out over the earth. He formed the earth and everything it produced. He breathes life into all the people on earth. Now let's say according to Jesus, in Mark 10, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And again, in Matthew 13, 19, and Revelation 3, the beginning of the creation that God created. And the phrase here, the beginning, obviously echoes in the beginning God created. Now let's see, according to Luke in the book of Acts, citing Paul, O Lord, it is you who made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And again in Acts 17, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. Now let's see, according to scholars, the famous Moody Bible commentary on Isaiah 44 says, God's proclamation begins with the assertion, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things. God's acts of creation were comprehensive, meaning that no other God created anything. God created alone. He needed no help in stretching out the heavens or spreading out the earth. He brought it about by his power alone. No God stood before God, against God, or with God in the formation of the world. Now, again, if language has any meaning in relation to how many creators were at the beginning, it's clear that according to evangelical scholars, it's a single, solitary figure here time and again called Yahweh or the Lord, the caps there, stands for the divine name in Hebrew, the four-letter name. And time and again, there's no God, no God at all, not just pagan gods or false gods, but no one, nothing with him at the time of creation. Pulpit commentary, he did not even call in the cooperation of a helper. Singly and solely by his own power, he created all things. And Phillips, citing the Isaiah passage once again, this phrase can mean that what Yahweh does, he does on his own, unaided by any other divine being. Michael Brown says, the Son is the eternal creator, the one who always was and always will be. But anyone can see that the Son is never called the Almighty in the New Testament, Pantocrator, that's a title unique to Yahweh, the God of Israel, who Jesus calls his father. And this phrase, the one who was and who is and who is coming or is to come, used throughout the book of Revelation, is always applied to the figure on the great white throne, that is, to God. And this comes from the Hebrew of Exodus 3, I will be what I will be. And that's where you get the the so-called four-letter name of God. And in the Greek, it appears as I am the self-existing one. Tell them the self-existing one has sent you. And you can see there the Greek, which is often misused to say that Jesus somehow, in a coded language, I guess, tells us that he is actually the Yahweh, the one God of Israel, ego e me. But as you can see there, what the God of Israel tells Moses is to go to Pharaoh and say, the O'on, that is the self-existing one, has sent me. Hebrews continues, quoting from Psalm 102, and applying these words to the Son. The Son is the eternal creator, 
the one who always was and always will be. That's what Scripture states. The text clearly and indisputably speaks of the Lord creating the heavens and the earth, which will ultimately wear out, but he, the eternal Lord, will remain the same. So this is very confusing because first, Michael Brown cites Isaiah to make the point that the creator God was alone at the beginning. But in this debate, he time and again went back to Hebrews to also prove that the one who was alone at creation was somehow accompanied by the Son of God, Jesus. But as Dr. Tagi says in the debate, context is king. So let's look at the context of this chapter. And it begins by actually telling us that the Son is invisible and silent in the Old Testament. In other words, the Son was not there. There is no Son of God in the Old Testament. And then it talks about him being the reflection of someone else. And this goes back to the very well-known New Testament theme of the Son of God being the image, the exact representation of someone else. And if, again, words have any meaning, the Son of God is a creation. It would be very difficult to understand a self-sort of sustaining reflection or a self-created image. And then this figure, the Son, is said to have sat down at the right hand of someone. This goes back to the famous Psalm 110, verse 1, where you have God, Yahweh, Jehovah, speaking to someone who is not God. Then the writer says the Son was begotten as the firstborn. The wider context to the book, it goes on to say that the human Son will rule the world to come, of which we are speaking, says the writer. And then the writer spends the rest of the chapter and the book quoting Old Testament passages once again as proof text to show that God exalts humanity through the human being that is the Son of Man, that is the Son of God. Going back to the famous vision of Daniel in chapter 7. Even more emphatically, he wrote Colossians 1, for by him, speaking of the Son, all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. The text is clear. The Son is eternal. The Son is uncreated. All things were created through him and for him. So once again, we have confusion here because we're not looking at the context. The Greek reads, in Jesus, in him, all things were created, not by him. Again, we already know from the whole of the Bible, that there is only one single, alone creator. And many translations will show in him and not by him. Furthermore, the verb created is passive, also known as a divine or theological passive, meaning that God, not the Son, is the sole creator. So God at first created everything for humanity, and you have the Greek there, dia, through, or on account of, that is, for the Son, the second Adam, who obviously represents the whole of the new human race coming into being, into creation. In other words, God is always behind the scenes. That's what the divine passive basically means. Note that throughout the Gospels, Jesus presents himself as the agent, as the one sent, as the one commissioned, as the one under orders by someone else. So it's ridiculous for Jesus to ever have said in any way, coded language or not, that he was that same alone, single creator of the heavens and earth. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So again, confusion reigns because in that passage, Paul actually identifies the one God as the Father, as the origin, the source of all things, as he typically does throughout many of his letters. In the Christian understanding of Christ as being one with the Father, there's a constant possibility that faith in God will be absorbed by the figure of the Son in the life of faith and overshadow the figure of the Father and therefore cause it to disappear 
and that the figure of the creator, sustainer, and judge of the world will recede behind the figure of the redeemer. And sadly enough, that is the case today. You, you really have to ga engage in a hopeless series of exegetical gymnastics to deny the plain sense of these words. 